Let me introduce our moderator for today. Our moderator for today's program is Brian Johnson. Brian is the CEO of Equality Illinois. He joined Equality Illinois as the Chief Executive Officer in 2016, which was actually the 25th anniversary year of Equality Illinois. As CEO, Brian Johnson oversees the three nonprofit entities that make up the organization. Each has its own board of directors, Equality Illinois Institute, the 501c3 arm that focuses on education of the public, media, and policymakers on LGBT issues, Equality Illinois, the 501c4 entity that advocates for the adoption of particular policies aimed at making Illinois a more equal and accepting place for the LGBTQ community and the Equality Illinois Political Action Committee, which endorses and supports political candidates on the state and local levels. So it's with great pleasure we at the City Club are proud to have Brian Johnson with us. He's going to introduce the rest of our panel. Brian. Ed, thank you so much. Thank you to Amanda, Alex, and the entire team at the City Club of Chicago. I'm looking forward to this conversation. And from what I gather, this room is about half City Club veterans and members and half new people who are particularly drawn to this conversation. So I'm looking forward to finding ways that this conversation could be a launching pad to broader and deeper relationships within our city. Um, so thank you. Um, what I'd like to do, let me actually invite the four panelists to come up and take a seat. I'll introduce them and then give a frame for how we hope to have this conversation run today. So Tracy, David, Kim, and Raina. Start with a round of introductions. I'll start on your left with Tracy Bame, the publisher and executive editor of Windy City Times. <laughs> Windy City Times is a weekly LGBTQ newspaper which she co-founded in 1985. Bame received the 2013 Chicago Headline Club Lifetime Achievement Award for her 30 years in journalism. In 2014, she was inducted into the National Lesbian and Gay Journalists Association Hall of Fame. She has won numerous gay community and journalism honors, including the Community Media Workshop's Studs Terkel Award in 2005. She also received the American Institute of Architects Chicago Presidential Citation Award in 2016 for her work on tiny homes for the homeless. Her most recent book is Barbara Giddings, Gay Pioneer, and Tracy is one of the foremost historians of our community here in Chicago. Tracy, thank you for being here. Thank you. Next, I'm honored to introduce Kim Hunt, the executive director of the Pride Action Tank, which is a project of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago. The Pride Action Tank is a project incubator and think tank devoted to action that improves outcomes and opportunities for LGBTQ and other marginalized communities. Hunt is a co-host of Outspoken, along with Art Johnston, a monthly LGBTQ storytelling event, and serves on several boards and advisory groups. She's had honors including the Cook County State's Attorney Bernita Gray Lifetime Achievement Award, and she has been inducted into the Chicago LGBT Hall of Fame. David Ernesto Munar has served as the president and CEO of Howard Brown Health since 2014. In that role, he has strengthened the finances and operations of this critical organization and expanded the geographic footprint of its services. Prior to Howard Brown, David served for 23 years with the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, most recently as its president and CEO. 
In 2007, he helped launch the Coalition for a National AIDS Strategy, which led to the National HIV AIDS Strategy unveiled by President Obama in July of 2010. Munar's work draws on career experiences and perspectives as a bilingual Colombian American and gay man living with HIV. He is an avid runner and graduate of Northwestern University. And finally, I'd like to introduce Reina Ortiz, coordinator at Task Force Prevention. Reina is a proud trans woman who was born and raised in Chicago. Her experience is navigating through this society openly as a trans woman for over 20 years has given her a great understanding of the needs in her community. She works hands-on with her community, providing vital resources, and has dedicated herself to building and working with her trans community. She is an advocate, activist, author of a recent book, and she is continually fighting for the rights of the LGBT community. I'm also honored to say that she is up here as my boss, as the vice chair of the board at Equality Illinois. <laughs> On a personal level, these are four leaders that I've had the incredible opportunity to learn from regularly in my past two years as the CEO at Equality Illinois. So mm -hmm. I am just privileged to be able to facilitate a conversation where they can share some of the wisdom that they've shared with me over the years. And I have no doubts that you will find the conversation enriching. So when I think about what we're hoping to do here, I start by looking out at the City Club of Chicago and seeing it as the critical forum that brings together our city's leaders from all sectors to learn from and with each other about some of the biggest issues facing our community as a city. So on behalf of the panelists, we are excited to lift up stories about Chicago's longstanding and vibrant LGBTQ community. We hope by the time you leave here today, you all have a greater understanding of the long and proud history of our community and a deeper appreciation for the many ways LGBTQ people contribute to make our city brighter and better. So for the first half, what I'd like to do is start with a little bit of a history walk. And as we always do when we talk about history in our community, I try to start with Tracy. So <clears throat> Tracy, so depending on our age, some of us may believe that the LGBTQ community in Chicago really began with the first Pride Parade in 1970, or the ACT UP revolutionaries of the 1980s, or uh, I see some young faces out there, so they may have believed it started with Will and Grace and Ellen DeGeneres <laughs> in the 1990s. But in fact, LGBTQ people have been a part of Chicago's history for over a century. Can you give us a sense of how our city's LGBTQ community was living and what it was like prior to 1960? Yes, and, and you know, I've got four minutes, um, so <laughs> the, um, the impossible, it's not even possible, in the, this book came out uh, 10 years ago, it's called Out and Proud in Chicago, um, I worked on this with a team of people um, as a companion to a WTTW documentary, so for those who do want, um, there are books out there, Gerberhart Library is a great resource as well as the Legacy Project, which is on Halsted Street, that, that can tell you more of this, because we're not taught it in schools as a quality Illinois is fighting for in, in Illinois to get our curriculum as part of the regular curriculum. Um, so even LGBT people don't know our history. And if we don't know our history, we don't know our place in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not empowered um, to be who we want to be. And, and so I'm going to do a little bit of an overview, but know that LGBT people, whatever they call themselves, have been in this part of the world, in this part of the state, well before Chicago was formed, well before the United States was formed, in Native American communities, and certainly starting when Chicago became official over 150 years ago. Um, there were LGBT people that participated in the World Fair, World's Fair of, of 1893, including architect Louis Sullivan, including some of the sculptors. Um, and then what I'm going to do is talk about a few key people that played pivotal roles in the pre- um, pre-1960, pre-1969 especially. I'm sorry mm -hmm. if there's like a echo going on here. Um, so, so one of the most important people in establishing Chicago's place in the, the universe of homosexual rights um, was a man named Henry Gerber, 
Almost 100 years ago, um, well, he served in World War I. He was a Bavarian um, by birth, but he lived in Chicago and served in World War I as a way to get out of a psychiatric diagnosis of a mental illness because of his homosexuality. While he served in Germany during World War I, he heard about Magnus Hirschfeld and his work in Germany on homosexual rights. So we have a lineage going back to the other parts of the world where homosexuality was, was finally being looked at um, by people from within our community as not an illness. So when he came back to Chicago and took a job as a postal worker, Henry Gerber and a few other folks, and not all of them gay, started the Society for Human Rights in 1924. As Jonathan Ned Katz, a, a wonderful historian, has documented, this is the first known homosexual rights group in the country in 1924. Unfortunately, it lasted a very short period of time because Gerber and his colleagues were arrested, put in jail, um, sensational headlines in the local media, and he lost his job as a postal worker. But fortunately, he lived on until the early 1970s and was able to tell future historians about this. And let me just say, I, I'm a journalist by trade and a historian because it's necessary, because many of our gay historians lost their lives to HIV and AIDS in the 1980s and were not able to be here today. They were the true historians of our movement, people like Joe Gregg from Gerber Hart Library. So I feel like I'm filling a tiny bit of his shoes. Jane Addams was mentioned, um, and there's, she's the mother of social work and also um, was with uh, Ellen Gates Starr. Um, her partner founded the Hull House, which, which I hope most people in this room know. She won a Nobel Peace Prize, and she later partnered with Mary Rosette Smith. And she once wrote to Smith, even though a lot of the letters of our pioneers were destroyed intentionally, but this letter survived. I miss you dreadfully and am yours till death. Um, Adams was not out in her life, and I do hope that she's looking down and, and now <laughs> is proud, 100 years later, that we could have this at City Club. In the 1920s and 30s, there was a pansy craze. Drag queens, homosexuals, and more enjoyed this era in m many cities across the country, including Chicago. And a lot of this was documented for the very first time by a University of Chicago um, professor, Ernest Burgess. He was actually going into these clubs and documenting us like we were some sociological experiment, anthropological, I don't know what, what he was doing, but um, he, he did a wonderful uh, research with his students on the drag balls, including one at the Coliseum at Wabash and 15th in 1932. When the drags entered, there was much laughing, particularly about one elderly man dressed in women's clothing, glasses, boyish bob, and out-of-date costume, shaved but chin showing a growth of a beard. Um, it's a fascinating article that you can see more of um, in Chicago Magazine. A lot of the black and tan clubs, which is what they were called, were the most welcoming of gay people during that era. Later on, poet, um, um, author, sorry, Lorraine Hansberry was among Chicago's brightest stars. She lived a short but impactful life, and she was the first black female to have a play performed on Broadway. She was also a lesbian, and her husband um, did not hide that fact after she died, and, and she admitted that she had advocated very much for the, for, the gay for the lesbian community in particular, in letters she wrote to a lesbian publication in the 1960s. And while 1969 is considered the start of the modern gay rights movement because of the Stonewall Rebellion in New York City, Chicago and other places across the country were actually um, very vibrant places for gay people if you knew where to find them. Um, the gay bars were often run by the mafia back then, even into the early 1980s. I would go into bars and it would be the mafia running them. Um, and they also uh, were paying off the police. So they were kind of paying off both sides of, of the way. But they were starting organizations like Mattachine. Mad they were fighting back against police harassment. What would happen is the police would raid gay bars and then Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sun Times, and everybody else would list the names of the people arrested. People would lose their jobs, a lot of, especially teachers lost their jobs, uh, lost their marriages, lost their kid, custody, um, and some even committed suicide. Um, this is how oppressive it was even up until the 1970s. But especially pre-1969, um, the community did start to fight back. They fought against police entrapment. Um, the police would, especially for gay men, they would entrap them, um, trying to pick them up, and then arrest them. Um, and again, people would lose their careers. Probably our Stonewall was in 1968. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Democratic National Convention here. Um, and the Trip Bar downtown was one of many gay bars that were raided before elections. The sheriffs and the, poli and the po politicians would come together and they'd say, we're fighting vice, even though they were getting money from those same bars. 
Um, and then they would raid them. They would usually coordinate the timing so that the bar owners weren't there and the bartenders got arrested. Um, and um, Jim Flint, who owns the Potancho Lounge, I think he was arrested over 45 times. Um, it was, yeah, badge, a badge of honor. Um, so the Trip Bar, though, was one of the first bars to fight back. Uh, an attorney named Rolla Klepek, is, who is still with us, she helped fight back against that raid and also changed the law for all bars. So if you were raided, you were shut down immediately for months while you fought it. The trip changed that. The trip took a case to the state Supreme Court and fought and was able to stay open um, while they fought and won their case. So people were fighting back before 1969. Um, we have people still with us today. Um, there's a website I created called chicagogayhistory.org. You can read uh, and hear many of the biographies of some of our pioneers um, who re more recently passed away, but also folks that are still with us today. This is important history to learn. Um, my nephew went to Chicago Public Schools. I think he had one day on the whole civil rights movement, certainly nothing on the gay movement. We are not taught the social justice movements that will feed the souls of the next generation to know that they can make change. Um, fortunately, with social media, we don't always have to learn it traditionally. But um, certainly, I am an advocate for the Illinois Curriculum Bill to bring this history into our schools. It's not just a national movement. Chicago played a, an extremely critical role in the growth of the gay movement. Thank you. So. So as Tracy alluded to, we often, when we talk about LGBTQ history, kind of have a, uh, a before 1969 and an after 1969 lens to it. And that is because in June of 1969, there was this powerful resistance moment in New York City, Stonewall. So just as Tracy alluded to, in Chicago, gay bars and their patrons um, had been terrorized by police throughout New York. But in 1969, patrons at the Stonewall Inn fought back. And for one of the first times, not the only, but one of the first times, the police were successfully pushed back by gay bar patrons. And we know that many of the people leading this fight were transgender women, particularly that night transgender women of color. So Raina, I wonder if you could give us a perspective about how critical have transgender people, particularly transgender women of color, been to the history of the LGBTQ civil rights movement? Um, hello, everyone. So um, I like to say that trans women, especially trans women of color, we fight the ugly battle, the ugly, ugly battle. We don't have the luxury of, of concealing our identities. We, the moment we leave our houses, we are exposing ourselves as trans people. And even in 2018, uh, working with youth um, and trying to instill values and pride into our youth, we have to. Uh, kind of give them that rundown, you know? Every time you leave your house, you are exposing yourself. We don't have the luxury to kind of tuck our identity away or our gender away, you know? Some do, and some try very hard to, but the majority of our community don't have that luxury. So trans women of color fight the ugly battle. We're, it's a consistent part of our life. It's in every aspect of the way we maneuver through this society, um, regardless of just going into the medical facilities or trying to change our name and doing all these things. We experience high levels of like underhanded bias on multiple levels in this city, not only in this city, but in this nation and in this world. Um, I am fortunate, and we are fortunate to be in this society and in Chicago, in, in a city that is very trans um, affirming, I can say it's gotten a lot better. There is a huge history of trans people uh, in this city. Um, there is a, a bar in Chicago, I don't know if you are familiar with, it's on 26th, it's 26th Street in uh, Kedzie, Costner. And it's been around for almost 50 years, and it's called La Cueva, and it's a trans bar. And people will come all over the country just to come to La Cueva because they know that they can, there's like a network of trans women who are literally fighting um, and kind of creating these pathways to be um, assistance to the next generation. So trans women, besides, you know, we all know about Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson who really like, 
got tired of the, the BS, like Tracy was saying, the police, the harassment by police and society, and they just kind of stood up. And, and, and that's kind of what we do as trans women now. We're just kind of fighting this system uh, every single day. And it's gotten easier. We have a lot of allies. You know, I'm here, and I'm seeing all these wonderful faces, and I do feel that you are here to, to learn. You know, so it's gotten a lot better for our community, but trans women, especially trans women of color, do fight the, the ugly battle. Um, but it's a beautiful battle because we know that eventually it's going to diminish and, and in the next generation of trans youth are not going to have to endure the various levels of discrimination that we have, fail, that we have felt uh, through generations and generations of you know, transphobia. So trans women are doing the work, trans women of color especially, and we feel it's very important to instill pride in our youth so they don't have to encounter all the things that we encountered in the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know, <laughs> and I know something you always say is that trans people have always been here, are here, and will always be here. Absolutely. Um, so if we build off of what we've seen in the 70s, right, we had uh, in 1970, to commemorate this, this uh, Stonewall Rebellion, so the first year anniversary of it, four cities hosted pride parades, the first one of which was actually held here in Chicago. And from then on, you see this rise of LGBTQ activism. But in the early 80s, again, as Tracy alluded to, the AIDS epidemic hit. And David, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the impact HIV and AIDS has had on the LGBTQ community, particularly in that first decade. Thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks, everyone. Great to see so many uh, folks that I know and love and meet new folks. Um, yeah, the, um, I think so many people in the room already have their own stories about the impact of HIV and how it's affected and shaped uh, LGBT history and and culture overall, but um, kind of thinking back to the early 80s when the epidemic began and we had no, we had no name for it, um, we didn't know its cause, uh, we're beginning to understand its impact on gay men and then really understand its, its effect on human immun immunology. Uh, those decades, the 80s and 90s, particularly um, for, for the LGBT community, were literally a natural disaster. Um, and, and it's, it's almost incomprehensible to explain the impact HIV had on LGBT history and continues to have on the lives, particularly of gay men uh, and trans women. And the, the epidemic uh, has claimed at least 300,000 uh, gay men in the 80s and 90s uh, and continues to ripple today. Uh, though we don't uh, have the same levels of mortality, uh, estimates are that the lifetime odds of becoming HIV positive, um, if you're a, a gay man, are one in 11. Um, and if you're a white gay man, it's one in six. And if you're a Latino gay man like me, it's one in four. A lifetime odds of becoming HIV positive. And you're, if you're African American gay man, it's one in two. Uh, and so those, those are, it continues to, to reverberate. And um, in those early years in the 80s and 90s, um, the kind of the, this crisis uh, challenged and changed uh, institutions, uh, challenged hospitals and social service networks uh, to respond, and many did not. Um, it challenged City Hall, I mean, ACT UP and other activists um, really challenged the city to take a leadership role in protecting the public health. It challenged uh, corporate Chicago. Uh, it challenged people's understanding of who we are. Um, you know, contending with um, uh, you know the community responding to loved ones in hospitals uh, and in emergency rooms uh, put a new lens on our lives that had not been seen before. Uh, and it created uh, a whole host of new institutions that were needed to respond to the epidemic, including and shaped institutions like Howard Brown that had started in uh, 74, but uh, started as a volunteer-run SDI clinic and, and counseling organization uh, run by med students from the University of Chicago and was on the front lines of the epidemic in the 80s. And, and we, had to look, we had to really deepen our bench uh, to do palliative care and hospice care and counseling and social work and so it really reshaped our organization. Uh, HIV also exposed enormous inequities and I think uh, showed that um, the community is not just Boys Town, but uh, pockets 
of our community exist all over town. And we are a really diverse community, uh, racial, ethnically, ge by geography, by income, by gender. Um, I will say it launched political careers. Um, I was so pleased that Tracy brought one of the covers from 1986 uh, that shows Dr. Ron Sable, uh, who was one of the founders of AIDS Foundation Chicago, uh, who was the first openly gay man to run for city council, uh, who tragically, uh, whose career and life uh, ended tragically to AIDS. Um, and it caused just unbearable pain and suffering uh, that I think is just important to acknowledge because so many of us who lived through that era uh, have so many people that we lost. Uh, and for me, the, the period when I kind of entered that work was in 1991 when I started work at entry level work, kind of answering the phones and doing some bookkeeping at AIDS Foundation of Chicago, almost out of college. And we were at a board meeting uh, one evening um, it was kind of our annual board meeting and it was going late in the evening and suddenly our switchboard like lit up. You know, remember when you had switchboards? Uh, all, the, all, the, all the buttons were just, you know, blinking. And so, you know, my boss is like, go answer the phone, something's going on. Uh, and it was the night that Magic Johnson had come out as HIV positive and our phones were ringing, ringing off the hook. Um, and then a couple years later, um, I moved over to Information and Referral, which is a fancy title for our hotline. And our hotline was the general HIV hotline, but also uh, the first, the kind of the point of contact for individuals that needed in-home care. Um, so folks that needed assistance at home because they were uh, sick or dying and they needed help with food preparation or kind of basic needs uh, would call us and we would do an assessment, get them a case manager and get them some in-home services. and. Uh, those individuals that, that I talked to in like 92, 93, um, from the time they talked to me, their, their life expectancy was six to nine months. Um, and so, and, though, and that, that, those, that switchboard didn't stop, it just stopped. It just kept going. Um, I also remember, you know, just, you know, I look back and don't know how we handled some of those calls, but I remember talking to a mother who said, um, I'm so concerned. Uh, my 23-year-old son just told me he has AIDS. Um, apparently his boyfriend does too. They're living with me now. Uh, I'm gearing up to pull all my resources to help them. And she says, I've already kicked them out of the house. I just need to know, do I burn the bed? Um, and this is, this is the kind of things we were dealing with. Um, uh, a friend of mine, Luis, a uh, dear friend, um, young man, maybe 27, 28, uh, Mexican, um, who, uh, just a great guy, wonderful young man. Um, he, his health deteriorated, uh, his friends pulled together, we buried him. Um, his sister came up from Mexico to collect his ashes. Uh, and we found out that his name is actually not Luis, uh, it's Jose, but he needed an identity uh, so he could work, so he could get health care. Uh, and his sister didn't know uh, anything about his life, about being a gay man or living with HIV. Uh, and then my own diagnosis in 94, um, at the height of AIDS deaths, I mean, there were 50,000 annual AIDS deaths at that time, uh, and how scary that was. Uh, so, you know, HIV shaped the entire landscape of how we, we think about LGBT work. Uh, it galvanized our activism. Um, it created institutions and mobilization. Uh, it also reshaped the way healthcare is delivered uh, because in 1981, not in Chicago, but in Denver, a group of activists living with HIV gathered and put together what's called the Denver Principles. And the Denver Principles uh, was a statement uh, of, of intent that all things related to HIV should be, should include the voices of people living with HIV and AIDS. And it also established uh, this concept that we're not victims, that we're not patients, that we're people. We're people living with HIV. We're people living, though I actually didn't have HIV, people living with AIDS. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of ethos uh, that, that the person that's affected should be a uh, partner in healthcare and should be involved and consulted uh, in response to not only HIV but any other cause now is well adopted in the healthcare infrastructure in the United States. And that began with HIV AIDS. Great.
So in the, in the early height of this epidemic, if we go back 30 years, um, Chicago has placed uh, very few protections for the LGBTQ community. You could still be fired for being gay. You could be kicked out of a restaurant. You could be legally denied credit. Uh, you could be denied housing. And then in 1988, uh, we had as a community one of our first major political wins brought about by many people, including uh, one of the people here tonight, Art Johnston, uh, one of the founders of Equality Illinois, who ensured that we got the Chicago City Council to adopt an ordinance, an ordinance prohibiting the discrimination of LGBTQ people in many aspects that I've talked about, housing, jobs, public accommodations, and et cetera. So, Kim, what, what has the world looked like since then? Since mm -hmm. that, one of those early big civic wins, what, what, what were some of the other wins that fell on the heels of that? Sure, sure. Um, before I get started, I'd like to thank the City Club of Chicago for having this panel today. Um, my back, yes. <laughs> so my background is actually in transportation planning. So I've been here for many riveting infrastructure <laughs> discussions. <laughs> <laughs> and I never thought I'd see a day where we'd be having a pride panel at the City Club, so thank you for this. <laughs> so Brian asked me to talk about wins, and I'm going to do that, but I want to take a moment to acknowledge that what we often look at as a win, that is a specific event that occurs at a specific moment in time, is almost always the result of imagination, collaboration, action, loss, more action, and more imagination. Um, my colleagues have done a wonderful job of illustrating this need for imagination and perseverance, and so uh, to make social change, and thank you for setting me up so nicely. And fortunately, we live in a city like Chicago and a state like Illinois where there can be many legislative and public policy wins for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, but that is not to say that there are not challenges, of course. So I'm just cherry picking some of the wins to point out um, as we have this conversation. So Brian, you talked about sexual orientation being added to the Chicago Human Rights Ordinance in 1988, and uh, we're still tinkering with that ordinance, right? So gender identity had to be added later, and just recently, a couple of years ago, um, with the work and collaboration of the Chicago Commission on Human Relations and Alderman Pat Dowell in her capacity as the chair of the City Council's Human Rights Committee, a coalition of LGBTQ plus and ally uh, individuals made some additional changes to the human rights ordinance to take out language that essentially would have required an individual to produce an ID uh, who's, and the gender marker on the ID had to be the same as the gender marker on the restroom. So that language got changed in 2016. Um, and moving on to the state human rights ordinance, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity were added in 2005. And then jumping way ahead, not that any, nothing happened, but uh, in 2011, we have civil unions um, for all couples in Illinois. And that kind of set the groundwork for um, the passage of the Religious Freedom and Marriage Fairness Act in 2013, which essentially made marriage for same-sex couples the law of the land in Illinois. And then, of course, that became overshadowed by the <laughs> Supreme Court decision two years later uh, that led to marriage being for same-sex couples being the law of the land in the entire United States. Um, other wins include updates to the Illinois Hate Crime Act to include protections for transgender people in LGBTQ centers. Uh, and more recently, passage of the Youth Mental Health Protection Act in the Illinois General Assembly, uh, very unique legislation in the country that essentially bans conversion therapy uh, that is usually often directed at transgender youth in particular, but more broadly LGBTQ youth. And then the Vital Records Modernization Act, which allows uh, transgender Illinoisans to change the gender marker on their birth certificate to reflect their lived gender identity. 
So these are just a few legislative wins, uh, but there are many other efforts going on every day that may result in legislation, new legislation or policy changes, as well as influence the deployment of resources across the city and across the state. And so among um, the work um, that our organizations do here, there's ongoing work of organizations like the Illinois Safe Schools Alliance mm -hmm. to ensure that all students have safe and affirming schools. And an example of their work was updating uh, CPS's guidelines for transgender students, and they've done similar work all across the state. There's the immigration work that predates and continues from the moment queer, undocumented youth from Chicago's Immigrant Youth Justice League occupied Senator Dick Durbin's office in 2013 to launch what became the Dreamer Movement and has since become a broader immigration movement. There is the constant struggle um, that organizations like the AIDS Foundation of Chicago and others um, put forth to secure and protect HIV and AIDS prevention and care dollars, and also this ongoing recent effort to push against persistent attempts to gut the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there is Lambda Legal's most recent lawsuit against a senior facility, housing facility in Niles for failing to protect a lesbian resident who is being bullied by other residents. And finally, another example of work that's ongoing that leads to legislative and success, changes of hearts and minds, and all those other things that we need to have a more inclusive society, is the amazing intersectional work to secure black futures coordinated by black queer feminist youth a BYP 100, and Black Lives Matters, among others. So while we can thankfully point to many wins, the struggle is real for many LGBTQ plus communities in Chicago and beyond, and I know that's what we're gonna move we into next, so I will stop there. <laughs> throw some questions out to the panel at large. Uh, if there are questions from the audience of the City Club team, um, can get them up here. I'll be happy to include them. But if Kim, anybody has any questions, just hold up the blue form and our staff will come by and pick them okay. up. Sorry, Brian. No, great. Thank you, Ed. So Kim, to build off that, so uh, a lot of work has been done. The pace of inclusion for LGBTQ people has been famously rapid. Um, <laughs> which has led many to wonder, I know I hear this a lot, about what, what more could possibly be done. But I think in each of our work and each of our identities, we bump up across ways in which LGBTQ people are not yet fully equal in our city. I, I'd love for each of you or, or some of you just to share a little bit about what are some of those ways we're not fully equal. And, and in answering that, I'd love you to bring in a little bit about um, from, from the different identities which we have. Nobody is just an LGBTQ person. We w live in multiple identities. So I'd love to just hear how, how various members of our community with different identities may, may lack full equality. Um, I'll start. Uh, there's, there's two types of homophobia. One is familial homophobia. Sarah Shulman is a, a fantastic writer who writes about this. The, the, the homophobia you experience in the family you grow up in can be some of the most damaging to you in your whole life, right? You don't have a safety net to fall back on. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that a lot of other groups don't experience. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, for example, if you're a different race from the person who adopted you. You probably experienced some of this, but there's a more intentionality about bringing you into the family, whereas um, LGBT people are often thrust out of the family. Um, so this is every day, this is now. This, this probably will be forever, but it certainly is still a very relevant problem now, which means that there are additional needs on the health care and mental health care that affect our community. Um, the external homophobia that, that, and transphobia that, is, that we face out there, we are so much in a bubble in Chicago, and we also are one of those cities that, that brings people from other parts of the Midwest to us. Um, and so we, are, we have people coming in all the time that have a different life experience, both anti and pro and part of our community. So Chicago is not some wonderful opening, <laughs> welcoming city to many, many people that are within its borders. We all know that laws don't change behavior and opinions. 
Um, and so the progress we've made is, is not permanent. Um, there is one Supreme Court justice away yeah. from taking back many of these rights, reverting them back to the states, and also losing massive ground across the country. So not only do we have to watch those uh, be guardians at the gate of, of the progress, but we have to understand that there are a tremendous amount of the LGBT community that has not been uplifted, and we'll maybe have time to talk a little bit more about the work Kim and I are doing on um, homeless issues, for example, and seniors. Um, we have very vulnerable populations within the LGBT community. You just don't hear about them. Mm -hmm. When the mainstream media often covers the, the glamour and the success and the pride parades, underneath that bubbles a tremendous amount of pain. And one, th one final thing I would say is being here today gives me hope because the LGBT community has a tremendous amount of assets and brain power that are doing solutions on healthcare and housing and all sorts of things. And everything we do, is meant to lift all boats. We are not segmenting the work we do on tiny homes to experience that only for LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. When those changes happen, it will lift all boats, um, all age groups, all uh, economic groups. So there needs to be more inclusion of these amazing people within our community, within the fabric of Chicago. Chicago is one of the best cities doing that, but there could be more. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add a little detail to that, um, and thinking about LGBTQ youth, um, they're overrepresented in some of our most broken systems. Mm -hmm. So LGBTQ youth re represent about 7% of young people in the US, population-wise. But nationally, um, about 40% of youth who are experiencing homelessness identify as LGBTQ. About 20% of youth who are in the criminal justice system experience um, or, or identify as LGBTQ. And uh, oftentimes, LGBTQ youth who touch the child welfare system are more likely to be homeless than uh, their straight counterparts. So there's a lot of work to be done um, among youth in the LGBTQ community and more broadly, I'd say. And then Tracy also talked a little bit about LGBTQ older adults. Um, another kind of part of the community that folks typically ignore, um, there's a lot of poverty among LGBTQ older adults due to the lifetime experiences of uh, discrimination that they faced. And then because we can't build enough LGBTQ se senior sitters, there just isn't enough money for that. Uh, folks have to move into mainstream facilities where many of them are experiencing some of the things that I mentioned in that lawsuit. Bullying um, among other <coughs> residents, sometimes um, bullying among uh, the staff, folks going back into the closet after being in a very affirming environment for a long period of time. So those are just two ends of the age continuum, if you will, within the LGBTQ community that need a lot more attention and devotion. Uh, picking up on that theme, uh, how Brown, we serve about over 30,000 patients and clients uh, at nine health centers from Rogers Park to Inglewood. And one of our sites is uh, the Broadway Youth Center, uh, which is in Uptown. It's a site, uh, it's a full service medical clinic, walk-in SDI clinic, uh, and a bench of uh, wraparound social services for young people, 13 to 24, who are LGBT, uh, and or facing uh, housing insecurity or, or homelessness. And you know, one thing that's common, uh, one trend that we see across our youth patients as well as our adult patients is enormously high uh, rates of, of experienced trauma. Uh, everything from uh, bullying or witnessing bullying um, to you know, continued bullying or, or violence that they experience, uh, emotional trauma, abandonment, um, sexual abuse, um, and then, and so this impacts you know their entire lives, um, which is why you know what we're seeing right now in terms of these children being separated from their families is also so tragic. This will re reverberate mm -hmm. in the lives of these individuals for yeah. for the rest of their lives, um, and we, you know we see this in our in our young in our, in our young people that we serve, but we also see it in, in the adults uh, and in our our mental health practice. Uh, where we see about 6,000 patients a year, uh, we see an enormous amount of needs around two, two 
powerful but difficult to uh, deal with you know, issues, which is uh, issues around shame and issues around toxic shame. And what is that? You know, shame is you know, people who feel like they did something bad. You know, they're, they're ashamed of something they did. Um, and it might, you know, might be you know, unresolved issues around their sexual orientation, around their family issues, around gender identity. But toxic shame is, warp, is, is deeper than that. Toxic shame is that not that you did something bad, it's that you are bad. And we have you know, patients, young people and adults, who are living with this every day. And what happens? It contributes to the fact that as a group, LGBT people have higher rates of depression, higher rates of suicide and suicide ideation, higher rates of addiction disorders, higher rates of poor health outcomes, higher rates of um, uninsurance rates, uh, lack of healthcare utilization, uh, higher rates of cancer, higher rates of smoking. Um, so we see this go mm -hmm. on and on. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, the, but it's not that the, the, the LGBT people are not taking care of their health. It's, it's back to this trauma and shame and toxic shame. Yeah. And so that is really, uh, you know, it, it's in our bodies, it's, it's corporal. And I think we have to see how we've absorbed uh, this societal pressure, and we continue to. Mm -hmm. and so we, though we've made enormous progress, uh, we have a lot, a lot of work ahead. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of bounce back what they were saying, there's a lot of good stuff here. Mm -hmm. um, I run multiple drop-in centers throughout the week, and I, I, when a person comes into my drop-in center, I really want to see them as a whole and kind of understand where they're coming from, because everybody has uh, you know, different disparities and stuff like that. So basically when someone comes into my, I really want to listen to what they're doing, what's going on, and utilize the resources that are here in Chicago. I'm a, a trans resource navigator, that's what I do. I really want to understand the resources that are readily available for our people. So when they come into my space, I have a list of things that I can give them to kind of like help with the high levels of disparity that we are facing. And if you were then, I mean, there's, Kim, I think you, you started to go in this direction to talk about just the, the sheer amount of good work being done to address mm -hmm. some of these inequities. If you could lift up one or two efforts happening in the city right now that's going to make uh, our city better and brighter for LGBTQ people in the city at large, what, what would be one of those things that, that you would lift up? And uh, let, me start with, uh, let me start with Kim. Oh, starting with me. Okay. <laughs> then I'm going to take uh, what I know Tracy's going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take the tiny homes model. Uh, so uh, ooh, four and a half years ago, Tracy and I uh, worked on this summit on LGBTQ youth homelessness. And a number, uh, because it was, I should say, kind of a solutions-driven format, a number of ideas for projects came out of that summit. And one of them was the idea of adding tiny homes to the menu of housing options in Chicago and specifically look at this model uh, for youth who are experiencing homelessness. And so for the past years, <laughs> I don't even know how many at this point, uh, we've been working in that direction and um, are partnering with a wonderful organization, uh, La Casa Norte, that has done uh, youth housing for 15 years now uh, to um, have a pilot. And I won't, can't go into the details too much because it's not, there's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross. Um, but we hope to have a pilot uh, within the next year that will include 10 to 12 housing units and a common house. Uh, for programming, both for the residents and for the surrounding community. And Chicago is one of two cities in the country looking at tiny homes for youth. Yeah, only two cities are looking at it for youth. A lot are looking at for, are doing it for adults, mm -hmm. not a lot, a few. Um, and thanks to Alpha Wood Foundation for being an early pioneer. They helped mm -hmm. fund the competition yeah. we did. And So I would, are you, go. I would add to that, um, I think we've seen a little bit of movement the last few months and even the last few years. I think that overall Chicago, the foundation community has been really lax in being an integral part of mm -hmm. the solutions that LGBT mm. people have brought forward. So better resourcing is what's key because, yep. and, I, and I say this about all communities out there, the solutions to our problems in Chicago are in Chicago. 
They are just yes. not the people that get to make the decisions and have yep. the resources. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true in our space as well. So there's been a few foundations that have brought together people to talk about the LGBT space and HIV AIDS space better than they have before. So I'm, I think that's something I wanna lift up and I wanna say needs to continue. And same with the corporate foundation world yeah. um, as well, that it needs to be more than about pride parades. It needs to be more <laughs> a deeper into our communities. Yeah. Raina, what about you? Undocumented trans women. Un un I mean, there's this, to, to be impoverished, to be trans, to be undocumented, to have left your native land and your family and everything that you love, to come to the United States, to seek a better life for yourself as a transgender person, to sometimes meet. Uh, the same types of barriers and similar forms of discrimination. And when I meet, a, a, an un, I met an undocumented a, a dreamer, a youth who, that, who was transitioning and it seemed like so many doors were closing for this youth that they were falling into like the cycle of what trans women do. And the limit and the resources that I had to offer her were very slim to none yeah. in this city. You know, I work with homeless youth, I work with impoverished youth, I work with HIV infected youth and I have multiple resources to give them. But when it comes to an undocumented trans a youth or person in this city, in this massive, major, fully funded city, um, there is minimal, minimal resources and they're sometimes facing the same types of barriers here in this city that they faced in their native homeland. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. David, last, last answer here. So, uh, if you could lift up one effort uh, that's being done right now that's making our city better for LGBTQ people, what would you share? Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to see how Chicago is mobilized around PrEP and how it's reframing sexual health. Um, and, and thinking about integrating sexual health as something affirming, something important, something. Could you say what PrEP is? Uh, so PrEP is, uh, thank you, yeah, it's uh, daily prophylactic medication to help individuals at high risk of HIV to stay HIV negative. And in other parts of the country, uh, it's, you know, there's been campaigns to shame people who need PrEP, who wanna, who wanna stay HIV negative. Uh, and then there's been barriers uh, created around PrEP, and Chicago has really gone in the opposite direction. Uh, I'm sure if you've been on CTA, you've seen the beautiful PrEP for Love campaign spearheaded by AIDS Foundation Chicago with a whole uh, coalition of organizations, including Howard Brown. And, and I think we're seeing um, Chicago is really at the forefront of uh, reframing sexual health. Um, and uh, making it something you know important for you to embrace, uh, and it's not just prep, but there's also uh, PEP, which is uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. So something offered at Howard Brown for individuals who may have been exposed to HIV can come in. They'll be immediately tested and be put on 30 days antiretrovirals to make sure that they don't acquire HIV. But then also um, making sure that we promote uh, for people who are sexually active regular. Um, checkups, regular sexual health um, uh, screening. And we're seeing that, that that, you know, a model that's affirming is also a bridge right. for our non-LGBT uh, counterparts who also uh, want affirming, non-shaming uh, sexual health. Great. Mm -hmm. I um, started this at least introduction of the panelists by saying that these were a group of people that I learned regularly from and with. I, I hope you can see why. These are amazing leaders, not just within the LGBTQ community, but honestly, uh, they are some of our city's great leaders. So I hope you'll join me in thanking them for their support.